Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Bruce Rosenstein. I will tell you all about Bruce in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what we so often call the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment, the compassion we have toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will very much discover that Bruce is, you do it with one purpose, to bring people together for common cause. Welcome, Bruce Rosenstein. So... Thanks very much, John. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, I want to tell everybody about you. Uh, Bruce is the managing editor of Leader to Leader, which is a publication of the Francis uh, Hesselbein Leadership Forum and Josie Bass. Um, he's the actor, excuse me, the author of Create Your Future, The Peter Drucker Way. Um, and he has written extensively about Peter Drucker, which hence the connection to uh, the uh, Francis's organization, a leadership forum. Prior to that, he was a journalist, worked for USA Today, and as a corporate librarian, also as a writer in many management books. Um, and he has done lots of stuff in our field. And I know him because he has uh, edited some of my work. And now it's my time to get back in him. <laughs> there you go. So welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Seriously, I, I love the publication Leader to Leader. Uh, Bruce, welcome. So Thank it's a pleasure to have you. Now, Thank if you. anybody knows leadership, it's you. And why I say that is because of your long history of editing journals, or you see everything from every thought leader on the face of the planet. So um, we'll, we'll dive into that. But right now, what's top of mind for many corporate leaders is the great resignation. What are you seeing from your perspective, or what are people writing about? So. Well, a lot of people are, are certainly mentioning it, um, both in in articles that we publish and things that we just get that we that we don't publish. Because, uh, as you know, there's just a lot of things that we get that, for a variety of reasons, don't get published. But I think a lot of people are try they're they're, um, they're obviously concerned with this phenomenon, and also really kind of wondering. I think in the back of their heads, you know, it, what is it really? And is it really a phenomenon? As you know, uh, it's kind of taking on this cast to me as something where it means what you say it means, you know, and, it's, and it could be a buzzword. Um, and is it really a great resignation? So, so, um, but it, I think what, what, what is coming across when people write about this in, uh, in their articles is this whole idea of the kind of things that you just mentioned a few moments ago about um, the soft skills and the things that the, the sort of more quiet things that mean a lot to people. So, Providing so on one hand, these um, executives are seeing that they need to provide opportunities to people, that they need to provide fair wages, uh, they need to provide some sort of sense of meaning and purpose. Like why are we doing what we're doing, and and that's what um, people want. People who work in these organizations, and if they do see an opportunity, as they apparently do now and have for the past year or so, um, to either you know, quit and do something entrepreneurial, quit and go into another business, go into um, some form of uh, uh, taking courses or getting a degree in, in something, doing something totally new, then they're going to do that. This is the opportunity. If there's any opportunity at all, any time at all, it's now. So you're right, we're seeing it. Right. And I, I like to say my little, my little buzzword, if you'll excuse me, is in the war for talent, it's over and employees won. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. So, but, you know, I think aside from compen compensation and I, you know, clients who deal with all forms of this. And if someone comes in and doubles their salary, well, you know, you, it's hard for some to say no on that. But you mentioned something which is germane to the leadership equation. It's meaning and purpose. So how are you seeing that expressed from what you uh, evaluate from the writers who come in or show you things so i think they're trying to show that what they do does have some substance in it it helps people it helps um it helps their organization and the and the people that their organization touches and of course the other stakeholders within the organization so i think that they're seeing now that they need to be explicit about that that it can't be just sort of a hidden meaning or you know gee of course we provide purpose because we make xyz or we provide X, Y, Z service. I think that we're seeing is that's not good enough anymore. Maybe in the past it was, or, the, or they thought it was, but it's not good enough anymore. And if you're paying any attention to, uh, you know, reading to what's on um, social media and what have you, 
you see that th this is what people uh, want and they're very explicit about it now. And so, right. and I think it, it is driving also some people to, to going back to either, uh, as I mentioned before, either to getting degrees or getting some form of micro credentials um, or to at least trying out uh, some form of let's say grad school um, because they've got that sort of opportunity now to do it. But, but again, I think it's just this whole idea of however you term it, whether it's soft skills, whether it's quiet leadership, whatever it might be, it's just needed now more than ever. Right. And, and, and sometimes the topic is, and I kind of, I, I, it's a topic that I've discussed with other guests and I always kind of joke around and I say, well, if uh, here's a secret I share with um, uh, corporate folks about this great resignation, I said, but you can't tell anybody. I said, it's have a conversation with your employees. <laughs> Here we go. You know, and it's obvious I'm being, uh, being facetious and snarky about that. But so often, uh, Bruce, I think that um, I, I'm not trying to throw managers under the bus by any means. I think we all get wrapped up in what we do that we kind of forget to have these kinds of conversations. Do you see that at all, Bruce? So, so. Well, uh, one thing I see is that um, this has been going on for several years at least, is that the topic of conversations is very big. There are a number of books about having conversations, having difficult conversations, but other conversations mm -hmm. too. And in some ways, it's kind of a lost art. It's great what we're doing here today, but I think in many, in many uh, uh, just ways now in terms of people and their friends or acquaintances or whatever, having an actual conversation is tough for whatever reason, either because people don't listen um, or they're trying to make points or score points or whatever. So uh, I think if we can get back to this, and hence all these books now about having uh, especially difficult conversations. Right. I love that, the art of conversation. And I think that we are so transactional. And, and, and in fairness, I mean, the, the management world and, and management as administrative is transactional, and there's nothing wrong with that. But this gets into your world as the leadership. And that's where the art of the conversation, I think, and how to have these good conversations. So I'm going to put you on the spot now, Bruce. Um, from your perch, a lofty perch as managing editor of Leader to Leader, reviewing so many uh, articles from over so many years, what's the state of leadership today? So what do you see? Wow. Um, I think the state of leadership. I I'd throw you under the bus. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it probably, you know, certainly depends uh, uh, sectorally on what, you know, whether we're talking, you know, politics or business or nonprofits, mm -hmm. academia, military. Uh, I think it's very, um, you might have used the word situational. I think it's, it can be very situational where there's certain, you can't do a blanket thing of saying, you know, the um, state of politics in terms of leadership is all bad or all good. Uh, right. You know, many people might say that it's, you um, um, you know, leaning maybe toward the bad, but you know, that, that there's a lot of people who would um, dispute that. Uh, and, you know, you have to have respect for people. So there are certainly lots of um, leaders, uh, let's say in the political world and wherever, where they are doing good things, they are really trying. Um, I think one thing is that when you really think about these really wrenching, awful past couple of years, just the fact that we're still having um, you know, with all the horrible things that have done that we're, we still have a, you know, reasonably functioning society is a testament to leadership and in a, in a, really in all the sectors that we're still going. Um, it's pretty amazing. So I would say generally the, the state is, is, is probably about as good as it can be now, but certainly with need for improvement. Right. And I think that's up to the individual leaders. Well, and that's, that's a good comprehensive answer. I mean, it's a, a, you touch on everything, and it, it, it reminded me that one of the joys of leader to leader, um, and I know that, that Francis Hesselbein's influence, but uh, most especially Peter Drucker, you're, you have always taken a multidisciplinary uh, view toward this. So you mentioned it. You, there are academics who contribute. There are military folks. There are business folks, nonprofit work all arts, all of this. And that's something which is very special to me, I think about the leader to leader. So we have it in different facets. And I think, um, what's the point of having 
uh, maybe a softball question or a hardball question. Uh, when you have a div- people from diverse points, diverse disciplines contributing to leadership, what's the net result, Bruce? Um, uh, you mean in in the in the journal itself, or yes, just, the journal. Yeah. yeah. Well, certainly we're we're, we're providing that provi- uh, variety of viewpoints, and we also ask our authors to. So let's say we have a business, and the whole idea is leaders writing for other leaders uh, mm-hmm. or aspiring leaders as a reader. Um, it wouldn't be so much aspiring leader as a writing an article, but uh, but certainly we have a lot of people in you know MBA programs and other uh, programs who are reading our. Uh, publication. So we ask them to um, make their article. So it's not, let's say you have a business leader. Well, we're saying to them, it can't just be about business. You have to have some language in there that says what I'm writing is applicable to you in some way. And it could be a soft skills sort of thing or something else. But I think that provides a lot of value to people. But it also shows people how, you know, to get back to Drucker, this whole idea of uh, thinking, thinking, and looking, and acting beyond your four walls. So you know, if we ha- and we have had military leaders um, who have written for us. So if you, uh, let's say, you're a business leader or a nonprofit leader or ac- academic leader, and you're re- you're reading something that this um, uh, 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 leader from the uh, world of uh, of um, the military world is writing, you're going, wow, you know, I never realized that, or I never realized that. Uh, the, hey, this person actually has a business background. This person has taught. Um, so, um, you know, not only taught in the military, but taught um, in, let's say, grad schools. So I think it really widens people's perspective to see that. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, the, so many um, senior military leaders I have met have had, uh, um, uh, if they don't have a PhD, they have a double master's. <laughs> so, and, yeah. and then, uh, and so they're quite well educated, knowledgeable, and they bring a lot to our perspective. And I, um, and I like that the way it's the balance of um, the discipline of the organization, but also the aspiration of leadership. And I want to say that's something we can learn. That's I say, I don't think we stress that enough in our, so we look at corporate leadership. Um, so so, I, so my question is, is um, you're supposed to say that's a brilliant thought, John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so brilliant. I really have to think of, you know, yeah. and, uh, anyway, uh, I told you this wasn't going to be easy. So anyway, so but we do have a question from a longtime uh, listener and viewer, uh, Joe, who asks, um, why do you think leaders don't put the effort in or do you say about developing the next generation? Are they too busy or What's from your what what perspective do you have on that, Bruce, from how you view it? So. Uh, from how I view it, I think probably a lot of leaders would say they are they are trying to do that. But mm-hmm. uh, maybe it's not totally top of mind because, let's say, uh, well, there are other people in the organization who are uh, thinking along those terms. And that's their uh, main reason for being maybe is is um, developing uh, kind of that next generation. And I think it could have multiple meetings because it could mean, well, the next generation within that particular organization, uh, or it may mean providing the kind of uh, tools, educational experience and otherwise that would propel that person to, let's say, leave, um, you know, with their um, blessing to leave the organization uh, and go out and maybe go into another sector, um, maybe, the, let's say, in a corporation, but then uh, uh, cycle off to uh, academia and become an academic leader. Let's say somebody wants to become, um, you know, get whole new degrees and then decide um, to do to do something else. So I think there's there's that too. And it and uh, but the, thinking of that providing, I think it's this kind of idea of generativity. You know that 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 you want to have, you want to be seen as doing this, and maybe it's kind of in a mentorship um, way. But I think we can't. Um, totally separate this idea of that sometimes these leadership opportunities are going to come elsewhere and not right. necessarily in your organization. 
And, right. and I think that's what um, something we can learn from the military, at least that I have learned, is that uh, leadership is a given and you are to cultivate it at every rank. And then you have your expertise, whatever it is, be it logistics, armor, infantry, tanks, whatever. Uh, but there's always that leadership quotient. And then the higher up you get, if you don't have that leadership quotient, you're not going to achieve that senior rank. So that's expectation. We don't quite have that in corporate, but I think things are changing uh, because as you noticed, you know, so as part of our, we've touched on this with people leaving their business or looking for purpose, they want to be developed as leaders. Do you see that, uh, Bruce? So, you know. uh, I definitely do. And I, and I think that, that another thing related to that is that people have to, uh, and this is, I think, something that comes from, uh, from, my study and interviews with uh, with Peter Drucker is this idea of saying of, of, of you know because you have to advocate for yourself the best you know and you have to do what you need to do as a as a person as an employee but um, if whether or not that leadership opportunity is provided to you or training let's say within your organization there are many many different ways for you to do that it could be in you know your religious organization it could be in your professional organization, you know, the Society of American, whatever it is that you do. Um, and that really that there are, you know, it could be political, I'd say. Um, uh, um, but that's up to you to pursue those opportunities. And maybe it wouldn't be a leadership opportunity right away. But I think you probably know in a lot of these situations, it can grow into a leadership opportunity real quickly. You know, let's say in, organ in, in professional organizations, in many ways, they're dying for volunteers to, you know, help run a conference or help run a workshop or whatever. And those things can be fantastic stepping stones towards leadership in the organization. I, I'm glad you're talking about that because so often we we talk about, at least on this show, we're usually focused on the corporate or sometimes the nonprofit world. But so, but it is, the leadership is what you make of it. And leadership I th has always been a choice, you know. Um, if, if one is going to be responsible for others, then that's a choice that you make. Um, and so I think, uh, so now I want to shift the topic because it's, it's you're the world-class expert on all things Peter Drucker. So what, what do you think uh, Dr. Drucker would think of the state of leadership right now or the uh, state of management? What do you think he'd say? So, um, you know, first of all, you know, I, I always want to say that I, I don't like putting words in his mouth because, you know, I don't know. Uh, he, he could also be kind of a contrarian, so you don't necessarily <laughs> know what he would say. You know, he was always tough on leaders and managers. You know, he had what, you know, I would call it kind of tough love approach um, and, I would say he wasn't kind of impressed with a lot of uh, just because he had such high standards and he mm -hmm. wanted people to have high standards. Uh, I think he would be impressed that, you know, we have as bad as things kind of are in terms of divisions among people. And of course, with, you know, what's happening now in Ukraine and, and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, um, but uh, given all that, I would think just the fact that we have some form of functioning society. And that was a term, you know, it was the name of one of his books. Um, something that was very important to him. I think he would be impressed that we are still going and that we have platforms here, like our video platform, that we can do this, that somebody mm -hmm. obviously had to be planning on this well before the pandemic uh, in order for, for these sorts of technologies right. to work. So I think yeah, that's a good thought. So I, I I like what you mentioned about the high standards, and um, and which leads to my next question. And it's a person that you know, and that's Frances Hesselbein, sure. who uh, she told me the story of meeting Peter Drucker for the first time, and she invited him to. She was then running; she was the CEO of the Girl Scouts, and right. so he wanted to learn all about it. And then they became fast friends. So. What has Francis taught you, uh, Bruce? I'm, I'm turn. What? Yeah, well, I, you know, it's, uh, I have known Francis, I guess, for close to 20 years now. So long before I came managing editor of Leader to Leader. Um, and of course, originally, I found out about her through the Peter Drucker world. And it's important mm -hmm. to note that Peter became, you know, after that initial meeting between Francis and Peter, uh, Fra sorry, yes, Francis and Peter, um, Peter became a pro bono consultant for the Girl Scouts for the rest of his life. So I guess about 14, 15 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but he, um, you know, and then they, when, when uh, Francis and a couple of other, 
uh, people formed the uh, what was called the Peter F. Drucker Foundation for Nonprofit Management uh, in 1990. So that was why that was why I wanted to meet uh, you know Francis. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I was very lucky that once I met her and got to know her, she was so helpful to me and wrote the foreword to my first book, which is a Drucker related book um, mm -hmm. also. So, I mean, Francis is, you know, certainly one of the most impressive people on the planet. I mean, anybody who's met her would say that. Um, and she's almost synonymous with, with leadership. She's got a great compelling story. Um, she's just so in terms of, uh, everything, you know, productive longevity, no matter what you do. But I, but one thing I, I would say is that, you know, she has this saying called to serve is to live. It's in every issue of uh, uh, leader to leader. So she's extremely big on the whole idea of, uh, you know, serving, however that, uh, however that is. But it, it's really also, and I think there was this with, I noticed this with Peter too. It was the force of their being. In Francis' case, you know, very quiet. But People want to be around them. People wanted to be around Peter. People want to be around Francis. Um, they just do. They want to learn from her. They want to be in her presence. Um, she makes uh, an incredible connection with people. I've seen her uh, not only with uh, just talking to people that she didn't know before, but uh, in terms of making presentations. Uh, I saw her make a presentation at the Drucker School in Claremont, California, 2009. This was you know, after Peter died, but the 100th anniversary of his birth, uh, and she gave a classroom, a big classroom, let's say 7,500 people. You know, you could hear a pin drop, and not only that, but she would just go over to people in the audience and uh, during uh, or in the classroom, I mean, and just make this connection while the course was going, class was going on. So, I, I like, uh, how, yeah, I just, like how you describe her as a, a the force of being, and it and you know, um, uh, it's not that she overpowers things; she draws people to her, and and that was so special about leadership. And then the way she connects with people, they want to draw, you know, come to her. And right. I think part of that came from, uh, I knew she came up with a term and I think it was in her book, but the way she managed the Girl Scouts, she called it circular leadership right. where the CEO, her was at the center. Not that it was, I be worshiped, but, but I stay connected. Was that your perspective? Um, uh, very much Bruce? very much so that, that she that she's kind of in the middle and it's it's great because you know she knows what's going on and she's taking in things from all uh, areas which was another thing that Peter um, advised people um, to do and she was really seeing the importance of the mission you know she was very big on or is very big on the idea of mission so seeing the, you know the mission of the Girl Scouts and of course now the mission of uh, uh, the, the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Forum <clears throat> that your mission is just so important and it's so crucial and you have to do what you need to do to bring people in and make them believe in that and make them, um, you know, want to contribute their time or whatever, their resources to what it is you're, you're doing. So just a tremendously um, um, impressive and also terms as role models. I mean, you know, for me, what incredible role models to have of, of, of uh, Francis and, and Peter, you know, um, that for just a million different ways. So I mm -hmm. think that people can learn a lot from um, reading uh, um, Francis's books, of course, reading uh, Leader to Leader because she does write in every issue of Leader mm -hmm. to Leader. So uh, I would say to uh, people on this call today, on the show today, if you have not read uh, Francis's or, you know, go on YouTube and watch some of her, her uh, her uh, presentations and lectures and what have you, I would really strongly advise that you do so. And great, great advice. So I'm going to uh, throw a, a question at you right down the middle. So um, twofold, you review a lot of manuscripts that come in. How do you stay fresh? How do you prevent yourself from being jaded as in this? That's why well, I've seen that, done that. So what, what, how do you keep yourself energized about that, Bruce? So. I think the, the quality of the things that are really good, you know, that really do work. And there's always a lot of them. You know, there's always really, <clears throat> unfortunately, too many. You know, more than we can publish. <laughs> yeah, more than we can publish. So th those are the things because you're right. Oh, some things come in and, and in, so, in some ways they're good, you know, but they're not for us because yeah. we're looking for more 
um, whether you call it cutting edge or whatever it might be, it's, it's stuff that's good, but it's been written elsewhere or that person has written it elsewhere, you know, or they've written it in their previous leader, leader article, whatever it might be. Um, so that's kind of a, another category. But I would say that uh, certainly in reading um, these manuscripts, and then again, you know, as with you, working with you, the, the fact that you get to um, to, uh, to to talk with the um, and have discourse with these um, authors is so fantastic. And then, you know, of course, you know, you learn more and you learn more about other people or they um, they, uh, you know, I might reach out to you and say, who are some people that I should be talking to? Um, beyond the fact that I also um, do a lot of reading, you know, and a lot of looking at social media and videos and whatever, um, and, and, and learning about things that way. And that informs me. And sometimes that re reading leads to me to reach out to somebody and say, would you like to write an article for Leader to Leader? So I think it's that why, you know, just you have to really be um, conscious of being out there and reading uh, what you can. And of course, you know, multimedia too, you know, visu what, what's right. visual and what's on radio, whatever. Right. And and again, I just want to iterate that the, what leader to leader brings to the party. It's not corporate leadership per se. It's leadership from many different uh, angles from and people of difference. And um, and so that we we learn from one another. It's kind of a, um, uh, see uh, many different ideas. And so we can pick and choose from them and learn from different. We learn from difference. I think that's so, so important. And I think so much in leadership, that's uh, um, a very valuable approach. So anyway, uh, Bruce, we are, we could keep going on, but I know that you are busy and, but uh, I ask every about guest that stuff all day. You know, so. <laughs> I have a question I want to ask because I ask every guest. So um, what is, um, I'm sorry, a story of grace. So what's a story of grace that you would like to share with us? So I would like to uh, go back for this story. I mean, it's still relevant today, but um, you know, you mentioned that I had 21 years working at USA today, um, newspaper. This was from 1987 to 2008. And, and I did write for the paper as well. I wrote about business and management books. But my main work there was as a corporate librarian. Um, and a certain amount of years in there, I decided that um, I loved doing that and I wanted to keep doing it as long as I could. But I needed something else. And I got interested in teaching, but I had no teaching background. Hmm. So um, I went uh, I had my degree in library and information science from Catholic University uh, here in Washington, D.C. Um, and I just decided that I was going to go and um, uh, um, talk to so actually somebody recommended that I do this. I said, well, why don't you talk to one of your former professors? And I decided to talk to somebody who was not a former professor, but who ran a program that I was involved in there. It was called the, the Practicum Program. Um, and she also her name is Dr. Preer. And she's retired now, but she taught management. Uh, but again, I was not her student, but I went to her and, you know, I didn't have any background, but I said, I'm interested in teaching. I'm just asking you what you um, would recommend. And she decided, she said, well, I will give you the opportunity. Um, you know, she took out a calendar and said like one month, for, I'm sorry. Yeah. About six weeks from today, you can do a guest lecture in my class about your work at USA Today Library. So I super prepared for it. I I was uh, probably over prepared. I did the lecture. It went really well. Um, she mentioned to the dean at that time that the lecture went really well. And then by sort of you know I don't know divine providence, literally <laughs> a few weeks later an unexpected opening came up for an adjunct, um, and I was hired as an adjunct. And I've been there now. My class hasn't been held for a couple of years, but that was in. Uh, 95, when I did the guest lecture, I was hired in that year. My first class was in 96, and I'm still part of the adjunct faculty. So Dr. Perr having that kind of grace of saying, you know, I'm going to give you this opportunity, but it is an opportunity, you know, six weeks from today, 45 minutes <laughs> or whatever, um, and, it, and it all worked out tremendously well, and I'm very grateful for it. Oh, that's a great st story. It's a wonderful story of a, a moment that has lifelong uh, applications. And even when that grace is given on a timeline, that's a good one. I like it. You got to be ready uh, six weeks from now. So that's great. Um, Bruce, how can people find you? 
So uh, the best way is through my uh, website, brucerosenstein.com. Um, there's contact information. Uh, there's things about leader to leader, about my various articles and what have you. So I'd love to hear from people. Great. Thank you, Bruce. And with that, we will go out. Thank you. You're welcome.